thank you for attending this online program presented by the Ottawa Public Library. And I will now turn the session over to Linda Buskey. Linda, it's yours. Thanks very much, Dana. So I'm just going to um, share my screen here and start out with a little bit of a PowerPoint presentation before I get into the actual demoing of the software. I find it helps set the scene a bit. It tells you sort of what my approach to photo editing is and sort of why we do it. So basically, um, Today, uh, we're going to look at, you, you know, with, with, with the Windows 10 environment, you automatically get a free photo editing piece of software uh, called Windows Photos. I'm not going to have time to go through that one today, but it is on your machines if you're in Windows 10 environment. The Photoscape X that we're going to cover today, and a little bit of Photoscape 3.7, which is a previous version, is uh, good for both a Windows environment and a Mac environment. So that's why I like it, and I like it because it's free. So I'm going to cover a, a, quite a few topics and hopefully we'll get through pretty much everything, at least uh, the ones, uh, the, the tools that I use the most often that I feel are the most important, kind of good basic tools to know if this is your first time around. But if it is not your first time around, uh, it, I'll be covering some more advanced things as well. So the first thing I like to mention before we talk about doing editing at all is making sure you have backups of the photos you're about to edit. Because, you know, you kind of get involved and you start playing around with a photo and you like this and you like that and then you don't like it, you can't do an undo, and then you realize you've been saving over top of your original. So when you get your photos off the camera, I leave them on the camera for a while, that's a good backup just on your SD card, but when you get the photos off your camera, um, or if it's just on a tablet or, or a cell phone, make sure you've got a whole separate folder that you can call originals and put a full copy of everything in there. I do that the minute it comes off my camera. I label uh, a sort of uh, overarching folder as originals. And before I work on anything, I, I make a full copy. And then I do weekly backups of my edited uh, pictures just on kind of an external drive to my, my uh, desktop computer. But you could do it on a uh, you know, USB key or anything like that if you don't have an external drive, but just somewhere that's different from your main drives. And then I also uh, store uh, copies of at least my best photos. I, I recommend you store copies at a friend's house. Uh, Chris does a backup for me once a month and he keeps that in his car or his house and then you don't have to worry about you know localized tornadoes or or hurricanes or fires or anything like that so this is just an example of how it may look in windows uh, environment in windows explorer so i've got my original photos with some subfolders based on the date of the photo and where i was typically your camera will probably assign a date folder but i can't keep track of where i was you know in 2018 april so it's good to kind of add a bit of description to it and then as i say i do a whole extra copy under a work area and then i may have some photos within that work area that you know i've set aside for facebook or shutterfly or whatever so that's basically how i do it so in terms of photo editing itself um are we sort of changing the truth or are we getting closer to it? And in my opinion, for me, photo editing is about getting closer to what I saw when I took the photo. We've all been disappointed when we remember a great sunset or a beautiful flower or whatever, and we get home and our photos don't look anything like what we saw. And this helps you make your photo what you saw. So that's what I saw was the nice shiny moon, those beautiful clouds, and that's what my camera decided to take, that little tiny dot of, a, of an orb, and it can be very disappointing. So the first thing, the most important, to me the most important function of photo editing is cropping. And it's cropping for various reasons, we're gonna go through that, but unlike when we shot with film, don't take your pictures too tight. Leave yourself room to crop for both uh, straightening is one good reason because that takes up uh, that takes up cropping space, but also cropping for uh, the size that you might want to print your photo and cropping to get at the essence of what your photo is trying to say. So think of photography as a as a craft of subtraction. You're trying to take away anything that isn't adding to the message or the image that you really wanted to portray in that photo. And then don't be shy with cropping. Be daring. You can always uh, go back and do it again. 
So when I took this picture on the Danube, I purposely gave myself lots of sky and water. I wouldn't have taken a picture like this if I was shooting film, I would have got closer. Um, but uh, I wanted to leave myself options. So my first uh, crop might be for, you know, having it on the background of your computer or a photo frame or something nice and long and narrow. Second crop was four by six, which is what you would print if you went to Walmart or Costco and just wanted a set of small prints to have or give someone or make a photo card. That's four by six. The next one is your typical enlargement size, which is eight by 10. Now, if I go any tighter than this, you know, you're not going to get to, you know, the left nostril of Rapunzel who's in the window there in the castle. No, but, you know, right now the, the resolution's still pretty good and my camera isn't particularly special in terms of number of megapixels. So uh, most cameras would be able to do those crops. So there are the, there's the original and there's the three crops I did uh, for either printing purposes or basically sizing purposes. But that's not all what cropping is about. So here's a picture of a, a cove in Newfoundland. It's a nice enough cove, but to me, I want to crop and make it so that there's, there's more, it's, it gets at the essence of the cove. So over here, I don't really need this mountain. The sky's not particularly interesting. These trees are kind of not even green. They're kind of boring. Uh, there's nothing at the end of this dock here. Um, we've got a little bit too much foreground. I don't like this ugly uh, building on the right here, little shed. So I'm cropping down to get at still a nice Newfoundland cove, but you can see things better. You're not distracted by a bunch of empty space that's really not doing anything for the photo. So, and then you may decide you, you don't even want foreground. You want to get down and really all you're interested in is the boats. Um, that's up to you. For me, I wanted the cove. I like my foreground, so that's what I would keep. Okay, so but here's another good reason to crop. You can save a lousy photo. So this photo, the lighting's not good. There's too much sky and water. I didn't like it. I almost tossed it aside. But then I realized if I cropped out that area there, it's kind of a nice street shot. Nothing wrong with that. And then if I cropped out a vertical there, that's kind of a nice shot too. And you don't have to get to the top of the mast. We all know what a mast looks like. So don't put in extra sky. You could even crop it really, really tight. Um, again, our brain fills that in. So from here, you go to here to two nice pictures. Another good example of photo rescue. Not, not, not a very attractive uh, angle of this uh, male buffalo. But by the time I cropped it, you could still get the image of the powerful male looking over his herd and you can actually see the herd better. So think about that before you toss a photo. Think if you can rescue it through cropping. The other thing that you got to think with cropping is there are three squashes in this photo, but we don't actually see a whole squash uh, on any of them. We only see part of the squash, but our brain fills it in. So don't worry about chopping up, you know, top, you know, hair or things like that. Okay, dehazing is a nice tool uh, in Photoscape X. It doesn't usually occur in free software, so this is a bonus. Um, and it can add some nice sharpness to a hazy day. Like this was not so much haze, but a kind of light mist uh, in Ireland, very typical. And this is what happens when I can dehaze it. Okay, and it's just literally a touch of a button in Photoscape X. This was a, a, a shot uh, underwater that my sister took uh, shooting through the water. You can kind of cut through that haze of the water. Also uh, useful, you can just see on the upper right, there's a bit of haze caused by the reflection from being inside a tour bus. We've all been there, I'm sure. And you can get rid of that. And I cropped out some extra things and just honed in on the purpose of the photo, which to me was the, was the bridge and the lovely water and tree. Now, I'm not going to cover this in my demo, but just so you're aware, uh, you can remove the graininess of a photo. You might have taken photos that were low, at, low light at night, and you can reduce that noise. And I'll just show you the next slide makes it easier to see. So here you can see the graininess of the original photo and then how I removed the noise with Photoscape X. So if you have that situation, uh, look for reduced noise in Photoscape X. Okay, other thing I've been doing a lot of work with in Photoscape X is um, old photos, fixing up old photos. And uh, oftentimes we do inherit these photos. This was from 1919, kind of not a great photo, but it didn't take me long, maybe 20 minutes, and I at least got it to this. You can see the men on the deck clear. It's straight now. There's less crap in the sky. So I'll just go back. You can see the before and there's the after. Very, very easy to do in Photoscape X. This was another one I did not think was rescuable at all from 1908. And uh, 
when I finished in photo skate backs, again, not a long job, maybe 20, 25 minutes, maybe, maybe less. I, I don't really remember. It wasn't onerous. So there's the before and there's the after. So quite breathtaking. Here's one where it's a little dark. You can see there's spots on the, on the photo. So I lightened it, but you can still see I haven't taken out the spots. And then I took out the little scratch marks on the road to get the final image. Now, the other thing I'm going to cover is uh, if you were, you know, if you think of yourself as a painter or something, you can see in the background there, there's some construction signs. You wouldn't include those in a painting. So if you're thinking of using photo editing and photography more like a different type of paintbrush or more of an artistic approach rather than recording a strict event, you can take those things out. But also, if I go back, you'll notice there was a couple of, of uh, sort of dead dead blossoms here and I just filled those in and put some nice little blossoms in. So it's things like that that you know you can you can have a bit of freedom for. Okay here's another one just an example of a nice uh, fall photo but that's not how it came out of my camera that's how it came out of my camera and I was able to take out those street lamps etc. Another one that's how it came out of my camera. Couldn't get under those wires or I'd have been in the frozen water, so I removed them. These deer were actually in the wild and they jumped over the fence into, into a fenced off area. So they weren't fenced in. So I wanted to give the image that they were in the wild because they had been. Um, and so I just took out the fence. Here's a shot from um, uh, the Mosaic Gardens. You might have seen them in Gatineau when they came a couple of years ago. Uh, but here's the original where it had that kind of ugly building off to the side. And even if, it, if I go back, you can see it didn't do a particularly neat job, but your eye doesn't go there. Your eye goes to the train. So I don't fuss too much unless I'm going to put it on my wall. Now, the other thing I'm going to cover is when you have a busy background and you kind of like to soften it, uh, you can do that with a, with a blur function and uh, you can choose the amount of blur you want. And then the other thing I want to talk about is when you have competing colors, uh, you can use choose to put the whole photo in black and white, or you can just choose to put the unimportant parts in black and white. Here's another example. Just put the background in black and white. Perspective control, I'll try and touch on that so you can see where the building on the left sort of bends in and the lamppost on the right, and you can adjust for that and straighten things out if you want that effect. If we have time, we'll do collage. Um, we'll see how that goes. Okay, I'm just gonna show you these. These are some screenshots from the software. The reason I'm gonna show you because sometimes on my screen, you know, depending what screen you're looking at it at home, um, it might be hard for you to see some of these, um, some of these little um, fonts. So this is sort of the main home page on the left. And we're gonna be mostly in editor uh, mode. Um, there, um, there will be instructions uh, that you can get to download the software. And when you first open the software, it may put you in the viewer mode to the left there, but I'm gonna be mostly living in editor mode. And that's where you see your pictures. Uh, on your folders and if that little eye that I've circled there in red, if you click on that, you get a whole bunch of information about the photo, like what camera you used, the time, the day you took it, the aperture, the focal length, all sorts of things. So it's a very uh, handy feature. Now, just down below uh, where we were looking at our thumbnails there, just to show you there's that gear, gear icon at the bottom there that I've circled in red. Um, that gives you this panel of options. So typically it will default to sorting your photos by uh, A to Z, which in the case of photos is, you know, numeric one to a thousand or whatever, um, or, but you can sort it in a different order depending on what you want. Uh, you can adjust the size of the thumbnails because I find them very tiny. Sometimes you can slide this circle to the left or right to make the thumbnails uh, bigger or smaller. Now, this is off to the right. You'll see this when I get into the program. This is kind of what I think of as the home page when we're in the edit mode, because for two reasons. One, it has a few of the very common functions that you'll use. That's your straightening tool, that's your cropping tool, uh, you know, rotating if you needed that. And then it gives you your panel. These will expand and there'll be various adjustments and effects and transformations that you can do. 
uh, and then these are sort of the main menu items that we will we will click on. But edit, think of edit as your home page. And anytime you're in any of these other functions and you click on a on a feature and you use it and you say, okay, I'm done, apply, it will take you back to this this home page. So this is just an example. We're going to use this color button a lot, not because we're going to just color often, but this is where you do most of your uh, light, uh, brightening, darkening, all your lighting adjustments, as well as color adjustments, but uh, all sorts of things. I, I basically live in this section for most of my photos. I, I do a little bit of light adjustment. I go back to edit and I do a, I do a crop, etc. And then almost every part of the software has a masking function. And this is great. It's built into every section. So you don't need to uh, go to a whole different area to do your masking. There's no layering, stuff like that. Uh, it's very simple, straightforward, and I'll show you how to do it for uh, a few different functions. And then um, anytime you zoom in on a photo, this little navigation panel pops up. And you just click on that with your, your mouse and the little hand appears. And that's how you move through your photo. And I'll show you how to do that. You can then also drag this bar over to, to make the image to go in even tighter or go out greater. Um, you'll see how that works. But just so you know that that's how you move around a photo is in the bottom left corner with that little navigation box. Okay, so here's my email address. Don't hesitate to write me. I've done lots of one-on-ones with people just through, you know, citing your computer. Um, uh, and then <clears throat> that tiny URL address will give you two documents. One's the document on how to download the software. And the, the second document is just a quick reference document for some of the things I'm going to cover today. Okay, so this is, um, this is kind of, as they say, the, the, where I typically will go when I go into the, the software. It might bring you the first time, it might bring you into viewer mode and, and you can go from there to editor or you can change the default so it always opens to here. So the first thing I'm going to show you is you just it just you do what you say what it says drop your photo here. So I'm going to bring in a photo just for us to play around with straightening and cropping. So I'm going to bring in this uh, photo which uh, clearly does need some uh, straightening and cropping. So that's on our main homepage as I said and my, as I mentioned in my PowerPoint. So I'm going to click on this straighten button here. And I'm just going to pull the little slider bar on the bottom and it may take a little bit of time to work on your computer depending on the power of your computer and there may be a delay on the zoom here. But I'm just going to pull it over until it looks pretty straight to me. Okay, and then you hit apply. So that's pretty easy. And now we're going to crop it because we've got, you know, extra trees and sky we don't really need. So I'm going to hit the crop button. Now, if you're new to cropping, it can feel a little weird. If you're not new to cropping, then I, I know this section is going to be a little slow for you. But um, in the cropping section, you have the ability to do a freeform crop, which is great if you're just posting it on the internet or sending it to someone on an email. If you want to actually uh, print a picture, you can choose a four by six dimension, which as I said, is your standard size if you go to Walmart or Costco or whatever, or an eight by 10. So let's just click on the four by six for now. You just move your mouse over, you left click, and then you just drag that shape. Now, it doesn't mean that's gonna be the size of your photo. You can move it around with the hand, you can make it bigger or smaller, but no matter what you do, it keeps four by six, and no matter what happens, when you take that into a store, it will print on a four by six uh, card or, or a piece of uh, photo paper with nothing chopped off, no heads missing or anything like that. So that's why you need to size things this way, um, uh, crop things uh, to this size before you print. Um, and then you just click on crop and it will take that image. I'm just gonna do an undo here. We're gonna go back into crop. And I'm gonna show you when you're in that four by six, you notice that even if I drag on the side here, it will always maintain that four by six aspect ratio. If I go into free form, this is, you know, I could do whatever I want in here and I can drag these sides and it will let me drag up, down, over, wherever I want because it's free form. And you may want to use this, as I say, if you're just posting on the internet, you don't care what shape it is. You might want a really long and narrow shape. Say you're going to do a banner somewhere. It doesn't matter. Facebook, it'll all take it. Doesn't matter what shape it is, it'll take it. Okay. 
So that's basically cropping. You just got to get used to the feel of it and pulling your corners and getting to know how your mouse works. Okay. So the other thing I just wanted to quickly mention with, um, with cropping is talking about people. Now, when you're cropping with people, I tend to go in really tight because there's just so much we don't need. I don't need the top of her little head here. I don't need her, I don't need her arm. I don't need grandma's elbow. What I'm really looking for are faces. So of course, when I take the picture, I might not have time to get the perfect framing because I just wanted to get the expressions. So I take the picture and then I crop it later and get at, get at the, the, the faces of the photos. Unless you're taking someone's bridal gown or something like that, it's really mostly about the faces. Okay, so I'm going to move on now to um, the lighting section. As I mentioned, the lighting is all under color. This lighting is not useful. They're just sort of these little flares and that, the fake flares. Most of the main lighting functions are under color. So we're in color now. And I'm just going to get uh, one of the first things. One of the things I use do very often is... Um, Applying contrast. Now, cell phones do this a lot because there's a lot of processing that goes on in a cell phone uh, when you're using that with your photos. But with a camera, it may not uh, give me as much contrast as I would like. So it's one of the things I often use. So I'm going to go into color. And, you know, when I look at this image, these fall foliage, and you think, ah, oh, you know, it was so much brighter and richer and deeper when I saw it. Why didn't my camera capture that? Well, you can, you can say, oh, well, what I need to do is saturate. So you drag the saturation button over, and that's what I see on the internet, and I hate that. It's so fake looking, and it's not what I saw at all. But what you can do is use this contrast button just above the saturation, and that deepens your colors. It deepens the, 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 the amount of black and white you have at either in, a, 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 in your photo, and it, to me, it, it makes it richer. And that's more what I remembered, but the colors don't look fake. Okay, I'll show you another example quickly. So here's a beach in uh, Nova Scotia. We're going to go back into color because this is it always takes you to the home page. And we're going to add contrast to this one. Now that's more like what I saw, that rich red uh, sand and, and rock color. So stay away from the saturation button if I were you. If you use the saturation button here, it's the same thing. It just ends up looking kind of fake. Okay, so the other thing I wanted to really uh, stress with this program is there's a lot of um, a lot of great ability to uh, to lighten. I'm going to use this one. It's an oldie, but it's a goodie. Okay, so this one I wanted to show you how you can um, uh, lighten areas of your photo, but not necessarily the whole photo. So here, my face is kind of dark. I'm going to go into color. My face is dark. My body's dark. But this is, the, the, the rock is, is, is perfectly um, exposed. So if I try and lighten by brightening the photo at the top here, I can brighten the photo by dragging that bar over. It makes me look great, but the rock now is, and I consider rocks important, so the rock is now overexposed, okay? So what I really wanna do is just lighten me. So I'm going to just say lighten shadows. So let's lighten everything that's dark in the photo, like the tree behind me and me and not touch the rock. And that's what it did. The only thing it changed on the rock was the shadowy part, which was the little shadows. So the way you can see what it's done and whether or not you've done enough is using this wonderful, wonderful button that comes with Photoscape X called Compare. And you, when I click on it, it'll say before above the photo. And when I click off it, it will give you the after. You can also use this little button to the left, which divides your photo and you can just drag and see did I darken it enough? Did I lighten enough? And you can see the rock really didn't change because we only lighten shadows. So it's just really, really nice uh, feature to have. Um, I have a few more examples, but I will push on to a different type of example in the interest of time. We can always come back to this. So here's one where I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to go into light. And what's happening here is my rocks, grass, etc., are overexposed and the bear looks great. So again, if I darken the whole photo, the bear looks too dark. You've lost all that nice uh, luster on his fur. So what I want to do is just darken the highlights. So I'm going to drag this over and you can see the grass got a little darker green. If I do a compare, there's the before and there's the after. You may find that's not quite enough. Let's do it again. So you just hit apply 
you go back into color and you do it again. You can do that darken highlights as many times as you want and it's not gonna affect the bear. Okay, so a good example to show you for doing both, which is great because one does not cancel the other, is I can do a light and shadows and a dark and highlights uh, in the same photo. So here's a little family reunion shot. So I'd like to lighten shadows first because you know the faces are a little dark, so that's not bad. But outside here with the snow and everything, I'd like to darken the highlights. So let's do that. So you could do that again if you wanted to, but you can see if I do a before and after, there's the before, there's the after, the dark got darker, the outside got darker, and the faces got lighter. And then, you know, I can hit apply and I'm gonna crop because you can get you can get the concept of the of the nice wooden ceiling without having quite so much of it. And now I've got my faces a little easier to see. They're brighter. Um, yeah, so it's uh, it's very handy. And don't so don't think of lightening and darkening as being uh, working against one another. The other thing that happens very very often, uh, when, especially when you're traveling, you can't pose people or set the light up perfectly. Is you get one area of your photo that's dark and the rest looks great. So I want to lighten the crew member here. So if I go into color and I do a light and shadow like we did with the um, with me standing against the rock, it doesn't really work in this photo because then it lightens the water, it lightens the trees, and I like I liked how they were. I like that they were a nice, a rich, dark color. All I want to do is lighten him. Easy peasy. So I'm going to use the mask function, but before I do that, I'm going to go down to the bottom here and I'm going to pull this little circle over and you saw that that little box popped up. You see the hand, you just click on that with your mouse and you move that anywhere in the photo you want. So we want to get over to the dude here and now I want to do a mask. Now Photoscape X, it's called a mask, but really think of it more as you're painting an area. You're either painting an area in or you're painting an area out. out. But we're going to paint him in and it's going to appear as red. And uh, red is the active zone. So think of it as like the hot zone. So I'm good. here's my brush size. So it says I'm in the mask and here's my brush size here. And I'm just going to reduce it. You can hover over until you get the right size mask. And so maybe just a little less. And then you just left click and hold and you drag. So I'm just going to drag it and I'm going to paint him, paint his face. I'm not going to be too, too picky here in the interest of time. And I'm going to maybe paint his hands here just so you can, you can see the effect. I won't bother with his whole uh, shirt and everything. So if I hit show mask at the bottom here, there's my mask. So that's the hot zone. So anything I do now is only going to affect that area. Well, I don't need to lighten shadow. I just need to brighten the whole thing because I've got it. I've got it masked. So let's just brighten that whole area. Maybe go right over to the edge here, and you can see if I do a compare, much brighter, but it didn't affect the rest of my picture. Now you may think, well, it's still not bright enough. No problem. This is a great feature too. Those three little dots here next to the mask function, you can copy the mask. You can say, okay, I like this. Let's apply it, but I want to, you know, uh, do it again. Uh, I think you can maybe go even over, no, you can't go over 100. So you have to hit apply. And then we go back into the same function color. We go back to our mask, we go back to the three dots. We say paste mask and you can hit your show, make sure it's there, there it is. And now we just brighten again and you can brighten and you can do that as many times as you want. And then when you wanna see the whole picture and make sure it looks good, you can do that. If I do a compare here, it's only since the last time I left that, that uh, you know, the, the, the second time I went in. So if you wanna see a compare to the original, because we haven't saved anything yet. Every time I hit apply, we haven't saved anything yet. I can hit the original button here at the bottom. You see the original uh, photo and then our fix. To do a save, you hit this button here on the bottom right, and you have the choice, if you do another save, it just overwrites the photo uh, uh, exactly with the same name that, that you were using, but don't forget, you have your original elsewhere, so you can do that, or you can do a save as and call it uh, another name, like version two or, you know, light and face or whatever you want. Okay, um, the next thing I'm going to show you is the uh, black and white. So just like I had in uh, similar to what I had in my presentation. So here's uh, a way that you can also learn 
uh, or I can demo how to um, uh, use your mask and invert a mask. So in this case, I want the doors in color and I want everything else in black and white. So let's go into color. So how do we get black and white? Uh, well, there probably is a black and white function somewhere, but I just tend to uh, desaturate everything. So I just pull that, de uh, that saturation bar over, it desaturates everything, okay? But um, let's leave it for now as it was. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna mask the doors. So I'm gonna zoom in and I'm gonna paint just the doors. And I'm not going to be too careful because lucky, luckily for me, the, uh, the side of the door is white. So in a black and white photo, it's not going to matter. And then I just move over to the other door. And I'm going to paint that one in. So again, this is the hot zone. So as I said, I didn't do a very neat job, but that's the hot zone. So if I saturate now, we'll just zoom out a little bit. If I desaturate now, because it's the hot zone, it's going to be the doors that are black and white and everything else is in color. And that's the exact opposite of what I wanted. So what do we do? Let's just invert the mask. And now you've got what you wanted. So anytime it's, it was just easier to paint the doors and invert than to paint everything around the doors. So that's a good, good tip to know is if you're working with a mask, I tend to just mask the smallest possible area and then figure out if I need to invert it or not. You can always undo, there's, uh, you, there's reset buttons, control Z works in most of the, the sub, sub programs in this, uh, in this software, so that's good. Okay, I'm going to move on, and I do a time check here. I'm gonna move on to um, some other common uh, things that you, uh, this is, you know, I'm not trying to teach you today, it's just a demo. Uh, so we're just gonna do some common things under tools function at the top here. We're gonna look at um, fixing red eye, very similar to many, many pieces of software. So I'm just gonna zoom in, use my navigation bar, and you just click on the eye. The, the brush doesn't have to be the exact size. As long as it's not hitting anything red, you're okay. Now the other thing I wanted to show you under tools is the spot healing brush, because it's very handy for a few things, not just, not literally just what it says, spot healing, but you can, you know, just take out a, a blemish just click on a little circle and depending on your uh, computer it might take a couple of seconds but most most computers can can do it pretty quickly but it is just a spot don't try and do large large areas like a, a, you know you know if she had a huge huge scar or something but but spot healing it's good for a spot the other thing it's really good for is um, Something like this, where the main part of the photo is the church, the people walking towards the church, but I just want to get rid of those uh, telephone lines. So I'm just going to zoom in a bit. I'm going to go up to the top here. And because it's a spot here, I'm going to give myself a good size brush. It's looking at what's around the area and it's saying, well, what kind of looks like this area and the lines an exception? And it fills, fills in. That's why I tend to do sections that are similar. So I'll do all the trees. Uh, at one time, um, careful here. And you can always undo and try try something else. And then we just go along here, but this is really, really fast and really handy when you're doing uh, this kind of, of fix where it's not where the eye is necessarily gonna go. So people aren't gonna examine it with a fine tooth comb. Um, so there you go. So the original had these lines and now they're gone. Very quick, very easy, but just makes the picture a little prettier. Uh, and I don't really consider it false news or anything like that. Okay, so um, now we're going to get into um, soften skin. So here's a photo of me a few weeks ago. I'm just going to get out of that one and we're going to go down to soften skin. Now this was very harsh light because it was basically you know, uh, surrounded by windows. It's like inside a greenhouse almost. Um, and so I'm gonna zoom in on me. And you can see that, you know, I, the lines on my face's, face are showing quite harshly. So I'm just going to paint over top of them. I'm just gonna draw over them and it will just soften my lines a little bit. You can hit apply and you can go back in 
and do it again. I don't like to do it too much. I just want to take off the effect of a harsh lighting, make it more like if you were in soft lighting or candle lighting or something like that. Uh, if you do it too often, you're going to end up looking like Michael Jackson and nobody wants that. So I just hit apply. If I zoom back out, you may not even notice when I, when I do, do a compare with the original. It's just a slight, slight amount, but I feel better about it. Or I could now maybe crop in tighter and not, uh, not feel that my lines were showing too much. So great tool for older ladies for sure. Um, okay, so now I want to move on to um, dehazing. So we're going to just bring in an example like the one I showed in the, um, in the uh, presentation uh, of uh, a typical Irish scene. And I'm going to get out of this tool area. I'm going to go back to the main edit because we're going to go into one of the uh, um, adjustments. So we click on that and it expands a whole list of things. And about the sixth one down is a dehaze. So the minute you click on it, it's automatically going to do a 50%, but I'm just going to pull that back to zero so we start from square one. Now with dehazing, what I like to be aware of, I often have foreground in my pictures, and foreground doesn't always look good when you dehaze it because it starts to look a little fake or phony because there is no haze in the foreground. What you want to get, where you want to get rid of the haze is in the background. So yes, I could, I could dehaze the whole photo, uh, but I don't really like that effect. So, and, and also with this dehaze function, they know that it darkens some shadows, so they automatically give you a light and shadows feature here that you can use as well. But why don't we instead just leave the foreground as it is, and we'll just dehaze the background. So again, we use a mask. So we'll pop open the mask feature here, we'll choose a brush size, I'm gonna make it monstrous so that I can be fast here, and I'm just gonna paint the area that I want dehazed, doesn't matter if you catch a little bit of the, uh, the foliage there. And we're just gonna paint the whole thing. And that will be the hot zone. And then I'm gonna do my abounded dehaze. So let's go over, well, that's like 60% or so. Uh, you could do more, you could do less. Uh, keep hitting your compare button until you like it. Now you might think, well, you know, the whole image could use a bit of lightning. You can go back and, and lighten it in, uh, uh, in, the, in the color uh, tab, or you could try some lightning shadows here and just, just trade it off till it looks like what you saw. That's what I'm trying to do. And then you hit apply, it takes you back to your edit homepage, and then you might wanna do a quick crop like that, and much nicer than the original, which looks like that. Okay, so very easy to do the dehaze. The other thing the dehaze is um, good for, I showed you the example about underwater, but here's one, this comes up often, just taking a picture through, through a window, triple pane. So it could be a hotel, it could be your house. Uh, and as soon as I dehaze, I can get rid of the effect. I take pictures of birds in my backyard and I have to be in the kitchen. They're not gonna stick around if I step outside. So I take through the window and it works well. This is in a plane, same sort of thing. If I, if I dehaze in this plane, uh, I can lighten shadows a bit, you, you, can, you can get a better, a better image, okay? So I better keep going here. Um, I'm going to quickly show you a blur function and then we're gonna go on to cloning because that's very important. So I'm going to go to blur now. Uh, so we're going to get out of here. The blur flunk function is under adjustments, just like here. So we're going to go hit blur, but we got to get a decent image here to play around with. So what I want to do here is, um, is uh, blur the background. So let's just see. So you can tell that it's books, but you know, it's not, it's not, you can't read the title sort of thing. So there's, there's, uh, there's the background. Now I can apply a mask and we can, you know, paint the background and it will blur, or I can paint me and we can then invert the mask. The other way you can do it, and I think I've included in the handout, is you can hit the fill button and that will fill the whole image with a blur and then you just paint my face back in. But in this instance, we could just do an invert. I didn't do a very easy, 
you have to watch the edges, obviously, and you want to make something looking pretty natural. But I'm just going to uh, uh, reset, uh, cancel out of that and do it again. And I'll show you how to do it if you wanted to just fill it in. So we're going to hit the amount of blur we want. We're going to hit fill. No, oh, that's too much. Something like that. And then you just, um, you paint me back in. So in other words, any part of my face you want back in. So it's just a second way of doing it. If you prefer to, to see the image come clear and the rest will be blurred, um, I'm not going to finish that just so I don't run out of time here. But you get the idea. And then, yeah, just be careful around hair. If you make a mistake, it's no big deal. Say I went off here and I thought, oh, my mouse slipped. That happens. You just click on uh, the the opposite, if you're in the subtract, you click on the positive. If you're in the positive, you, you click on the negative. So here we're just going to take that out. And you can click and unclick as number of times as you want. So that's taking it out. And then this is going to pull it back in. And, and you don't have to worry about doing it all in one sweep. It's actually better if you kind of take multiple steps. And then if you do a goof and you do an undo, uh, you don't have to redo a whole bunch that you've already painted. So yeah, it's it's very easy that way. Now, the minute you hit apply, it's gone unless you save the mask like I showed you. So there's the before and there's the after. So very handy if you're you know in a restaurant, you want to blur the, the noisy background or something like that. OK, I'm going to move on to. Just a um, time check, Linda, that you're down to 15 minutes. Yeah, thank you. OK. So the other thing you can do on, a, on images that is kind of nice, especially with uh, people or birds or a single object, is you can add a little vignette at the end and that's on this under adjustments too and that's just a little black thing you know shadow that will add a nice little vignette you can change the size or if it's a baby or a bride sometimes i use a white vignette when you're not actually trying to draw the attention in but you're just trying to set an ethereal mood or something so vignettes are good to, to polish off and finish off the picture Okay, we're going to shift gears now. We're going to go into the clone brush or clone stamp, it's sometimes called. And in this, in this program, it's under tools. But as soon as you click, well, here, unfortunately, I bought this program. But when you click on the clone stamp on the free version, it will say you have to buy it. So I'm going to demo it in this free version. I'm just going to stop and I'll have to go back. This free version 3.7 actually included a free clone brush for whatever reason. It's not as good a program, uh, but we'll go into editor. But if you don't want to spend the Photoscape X to buy it is about $60 Canadian. So it's not hugely expensive, but get to know it. If you like it, it's well worth paying the $60 I find to have that clone brush kind of handy. But here it's the same sort of deal. You just drag your picture in and then under tools at the bottom here is a clone stamp. And what you need to know first about a clone stamp is that it, it, you, hopefully you can see the little circle. I'm going to make it bigger so you can see it better. Yeah, uh, we can see it pretty good. Okay, great. So the first thing to understand about a clone stamp, it's not like the spot erase. It's not looking around at your other pixels and saying, hmm, let's sort of in this area. It is a clone, just like Dolly the sheep, it's a clone. So if I click on my sister's head here and I go over here, click, hold, it, and it, there's instructions below if you forget. Uh, it will just do an exact clone of her, okay? So we're gonna do that, undo that. So what I really wanna do in this picture, I'll make my brush a little smaller, is I really want to, uh, I'm gonna zoom in here with the plus signs. I really wanna get rid of that stuff here. And anytime you wanna reset your clone, you just hit escape. So what I really wanna do is just get rid of the, the snow fence and the guys there that are hanging out. So I'm gonna hit an area there that's kinda of green, and I'm gonna go over here. And as I move, it's going to move. So it's going to move from that dark green over to this area, to this area, wherever I go. So I'm going to left click and hold, and I'm just going to paint. And it's going to paint wherever that anchor is. So if I go up here, it's going to paint ocean, okay? If I stay in the green, it'll paint the green, and it'll you know, cover up whatever I don't want. Now, obviously, you're not going to leave it like that. That's just to illustrate. If I wanted to get rid of a garbage can, I can click on the, the gray and maybe you know just brush out that can and you can smooth that out with, with other means or choose a different color. Your eye isn't going there, your eye is going to my sister. 
So the other thing I wanted to show that was I did with this was I I oh, hit escape. I have a slightly bigger brush here. I just hit some random driftwood and I, I just wanted to take out that jacket because I didn't think that added much to the picture. So I just took out the, the yellow. And again, as I say, the instructions are down below if you forget how to do it. Um, and, and that's it. So then um, go back out to normal size. Whoops. Normal size. And then you can throw it back into your Photoscape X or you can crop it here after you fix the ocean thing there that I screwed up. Uh, and and like that so it's it's very easy get to know clone it's really powerful uh and then if you like it as i say you might want to um might want to use the the paid version for that so i'm going to um flip back to the other one and uh if i do if there are any questions about cloning i might use this just so i don't have to flip back and forth but there it's time for, I just wanted to cover one more thing before we stop and take uh, questions. And then the, if, uh, depending on people's interests, you can perhaps stay later. I will try and cover another topic uh, to do with collage making after the question period. So I'm gonna show you uh, one, more, one more function. And what it is, is uh, doing the transformation like I, I was illustrating in the uh, in the PowerPoint presentation, trans uh, adjusting for perspective. So we're going to collapse this adjustment section. And it's down in transformations here, and I'm just going to go down to perspective, and then you just pull this vertical bar over, and it will basically it, it just shifts the pixels of your photo so that you get straighter lines on the side here. So if I do a compare, you can see that line that was tilting in on the left becomes a little straighter. And it makes things a little squatter and you need to give yourself room to crop. So if you are shooting up at a building, you will always get this effect. If I was on the third floor of a building across the street, I wouldn't need to do this. Uh, or if you're shooting down, you get the opposite effect. But here, being my five foot one inches, I'm always shooting up. So I get this effect often. Uh, so then you just hit apply. And then you go you're into your, your home page and you just hit crop and uh, just you know crop it so that you don't see those uh, white bars. And that's your, your final and that's your original. So um, I think maybe I can squeak in one more thing here. One more thing very, very quickly. I'll just show you uh, under adjustments, there's a sharpen tool that is very useful for all sorts of things, but I'm just gonna show you how it can help with say a bird. So by sharpening, uh, if I increase this amount, quite drastically say, uh, I'll do a compare. You can see how it sharpens, hopefully you can see that, how it really can sharpen up feathers or even you know anything that you, flower edges, anything like that. You don't wanna try and make an unfocused picture into focus but if your picture is just slightly soft it can really help okay um let's uh let's uh i'm gonna do a stop share uh or chris would you rather just give me the questions um from the chat if there are any yeah uh there are some uh some questions out of the chat uh but uh, yeah most of them are sort of generic i can read them out to you if you want or if you stop sharing you could look through them i can i've captured just the questions if you want okay i'll stop sharing i'll take a look at the chat okay it's fairly long and there's a, a bunch of interleave stuff so uh it might be easier if i read out some of them from anna okay. b um can you comment on how photo, photoscape compares to an editing program like lightroom or photoshop yeah sure so lightroom obviously is a very popular one um, uh, being, I think, I believe, uh, Adobe product, a lot. It's very popular. Uh, nothing wrong with it. It's very comprehensive. Probably uh, there would be uh, more uh, intricate uh, tools within Lightroom than here if you are advanced. If you just want to do the basic things, I prefer Photoscape X because I find it very, very easy to learn. Uh, and also it's free. With, with the Lightroom, they have now instigated, as far as I know, they've instigated a subscription fee. So you can't just go buy it once, you have to pay an annual subscription, I don't like that. So um, I, I use On One Photo Raw for 
uh, things that I want to do that are more advanced than Photoscape might want to do. Photoscape can handle raw images, which is good. Um, but for, uh, I, I prefer it if, if you're just doing straightforward uh, masking and things like that. If you want to get into the in-depth, there's nothing wrong, absolutely nothing wrong with Lightroom. But, they're, they're, and, but on one so far, you buy it once, there is no subscription fee. So I prefer on one photo raw. Okay, there was uh, uh, several questions that were talking about cropping and uh, what resolution you need for uh, what size of printing and uh, when you're cropping, what would be considered to be too severe a cropping that you are you going to lose resolution? How yeah. severe is it going to be? Okay, good question. So uh, with the cropping, uh, this, this, is, this is maybe something I'll mention if you're cropping from a cell phone picture, you're going to run into trouble because a cell phone, when you use your zoom, you're already cropping. It's not an optical zoom. It's, it's a digital zoom. So when you think of uh, cropping, it's, um, you know, use the zoom as much as you can on a, on a camera, even if it's only an old camera from the 90s, it, early 2000s, say a two times or three times zoom, you, you, you can crop and you'd still have plenty of megapixels to do an eight by 10. Uh, you can pretty much tell if you look at it on a big screen. When you start seeing it looks like Super Mario or something, it's all pixelated, then uh, obviously you want to back off. So when I take bird pictures, I don't have a super long lens, so I crop, but I, I leave the, the fur not, you know, you can't see the eyeball really huge or anything. I leave nature around it because it's just not going to, it's, I just don't have the resolution. So you have to play around with that and get to know. But for uh, most cameras, there's plenty of resolution to, to crop in uh, a, a fair amount uh, to, to, then, to then print. But I, I would, unless Chris has additional, you can, you can look yeah. at the size of the image. Is there a good rule of thumb? I don't know in terms it, of the- yeah. There's no, there's no magic answer to it for sure. Uh, it's all about perception and so forth. But as a general rule, I usually say that an eight megapixel image could produce a good eight by ten print. Uh, yeah, as you go, even a six even a six megapixel image will. Yeah. Go yeah. I mean, it, it's all very close and it's, it's degrees of how uh, unsharp it looks. As you get bigger, one of the things to keep in mind, like if I say an 8 by 10 could be done from uh, an 8 megapixel uh, image, you might say, well, 16 by 20, that's four times as many pixels. So therefore, to get the same quality, you know, I'd need a 32 megapixel camera. No, because you're going to be viewing it from farther back. So the farther away you are when you're viewing the image, the more you can get away with lower resolution. Yeah. So again, there's no magic bullet uh, to it, but uh, you really have to try it out and see what your perception is, what you're willing to put up with in terms of lower resolution. Again, the other thing to consider is if you're just uh, displaying things on screen, yeah. you can get away with almost anything. Because if you look at a high def screen, 1920 by 1080, well, that's only two megapixels. Yeah. So. No, you can get away with severe cropping in on your images if you're only going to be displaying them on screen or on social media or something like yeah. that. that that's, that's a good point, yeah. And what I typically do if I'm not sure is, uh, like I have my own printer, but I just print a four by six and I look at it before I would go and you know waste the ink on an eight by 10. So any other questions? Uh, yeah, we had some questions about uh, recommendations for basic photo courses. Uh, we had one person comment back that they had, uh, I, I mentioned Henry's uh, photo store in town does have some photo courses. There's somebody else who commented that uh, they'd taken them at PSAO, the School of Phot Photographic Arts, Ottawa, uh, yeah. has excellent courses. And uh, the, somebody else talked about possibility yeah. through continuing education courses. The other thing I should mention is on Photoscape X, um, at the top left corner, there's a little Photoscape X icon. When you click on that, there's a series of videos on clone or whatever. And as long as you've got an internet connection when you're using the Photoscape X, you can say, oh, I can't remember how you do clone. You just click on that and it runs a little 20 second, 30 second video on how to do clone or how to do spot heal. So that's always a quick reference. I noticed there's a comment about GIMP. And for sure, it is free and it's powerful. Nothing wrong with it. The only reason I'm doing Photoscape X as a demo is because I know it, okay? It's not like it's the only good one out there. So whatever works for people, but I think uh, Photoscape X has enough of the features that you do find common in other free software. You just don't always 
have the perspective control in free software, you don't always have a dehaze in the free software, and you don't always have masking ability in every single uh, subsection of the program. So I, I like it for that. Another question from Anna B. To clarify, do you need to purchase the program to get the clone tool, or is it included in the newer version of the software? No, it's not included in any of the new versions of the free software. It's, 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 uh, it, it, as soon as you get the free software, there's different areas where they will say, oh, if you want this, you, you, you get pro. But most of those areas are just more options for things within the function. The only function I noticed missing uh, was the clone bar. So no, you have to, you have to buy it. And that you can get if you pay, if, if you buy the program. And uh, clarify as well, if you have multiple computers, it can be a deal because it's through the Windows Store. And uh, when you pay your $60 Canadian to get it, you can actually install it on up to 10 computers. Yeah, uh, so it can be a good deal. Yeah, so I install it on my laptop, which I travel with. So while I'm traveling, if there's any delays or if it's a rainy day or don't feel like taking photos, I, I start editing my photos during during my trip if I feel like it. So, so yeah. uh, just to complete that, if you if you want a clone tool and not spend any money, use Photoscape X for all of the main functions. And for the clone tool, you can always save your photo, load it into the old version, Photoscape 3.7, and it does have a free clone tool. Um, I think that that was about it for questions. Um, we did have other comments about GIMP being yeah. useful and so forth. Uh, mention, mention, let's mention the lynda.com. I wish it was me, but it's not me. Lynda.com <laughs> is a great resource and Chris yeah, and I yeah. take photo courses within that uh, software, within that site as well. There's some really good photographers and um, I like it because uh, the one I'm doing right now, Bill Long, he has um, uh, lessons that are literally three or four minutes long. So if you only have time to watch a couple, you just watch a couple, but the whole course is 75 hours long, but I just do them at 10 minute, 10 minute pieces that I can squeeze in. Yeah, Ben Long is great. I've, I've looked at a lot of his and they're really good. There was a comment from the library as well that anybody who's interested, this is going to be captioned and put up on the library's YouTube channel. Uh, it will probably take about a month before it gets up there. And somebody who just commented, oh, Jill just commented that, yeah, lynda.com is free if you go through the library website. So a lot of courses that you would have to pay uh, good money for you can get for free through the Auto Public Library. So that's great. It's a very, very good resource. So we're gonna turn it back to Shana for a couple minutes, but hang on folks, if you do wanna get a little bit more extra. Hi again. Okay, I'd like to thank Linda and Chris very much for this terrific presentation. And I'd like to remind everybody that um, we'll, they'll be back again next week when Linda will be talking about ways in which you can share these photos that you've now edited so expertly um, on the web. Um, and if you haven't managed to copy down the URLs that Chris has posted in the, in, um, the chat for Ottawa PC Users Group and for Linda's presentation, um, they will be sent to you via e uh, Eventbrite. So thank you all, all again for everybody who attended and um, goodbye for now, except if you'd like to stay an extra 10 minutes and um, listen to Linda talk about collage, um, you can do that as well. But for everybody else, thank you very much and goodbye for now. Thanks, Shane. Okay, so if for those interested, I'm just going to... Uh, Go back and, and share my screen again and I'm just going to quickly show uh, two ways that you can make a collage within um, within Photoscape X. Uh, so the easiest way is up at the top there's a there's a collage tab so that's the easy way you click on that and then off to the side you can choose how many photos you're going to have in your collage and it will give you various uh, layouts. Now some of these layouts towards the bottom you get with the paid version, but these ones at the top are are all uh, readily available. So if I if I just click on that, um, and you have you have options, you can move things around within the shape the the shape of your collage. So let me just bring in uh, a couple of pictures, and you can just see how it works. You can move the picture sometimes a little bit depending on the shape of the uh, of the space. Okay, and as I say, you can. You can drag things around. 
um, whoops. So that that's whoops. Put that one in. We'll put in put in a bird. Doesn't want to go in. Oh, I think it's pulled in another image here. So just, there we go. Um, so that's that's the easy way of of doing this. I don't know why it's bringing in this green thing. It could be I've got a. No, I don't know why it's. Okay, well, anyway, that's that's how that one works. You just bring in, you bring in various images into that little structure. Okay, so, um, but the the thing I don't like about this uh, is it it is no particular dimension. So if you're going to post this online or send it to someone or just have it on your computer, that's fine. But it does not print well because it is not an eight by ten. It's not a particular dimension that you could you could take to a a store and print and I like to print my collages uh, so I prefer to do slightly uh, longer way of doing it but it gives me more control so we're going to go back to edit and the way that we're going to do it is we're going to create um, a layering process so in um, in Photoscape X there there is this layering feature called insert at the top here so what I'm going to do is just pull in a, a blank background and, and uh, the notes that uh, you can pick up will show you how to create a, a plain background from any image. And this is an 8 by 10. And I, I put a little frame around it using this function. Uh, you can just choose a little subtle frame. Okay. And then what I want to do is um, then insert uh, images uh, onto it, but before I do that, I'm just going to go back to edit there. But when you bring in an image, you may want to frame it first, okay? So I'll just show one quickly how to frame it. So you can hit frames, but not these kind of frames. I like to do a, a, just a nice plain border. So I'm going to go over here and then change the color to black. And what I like about this program, you can make it big, you can make it small. Uh, whatever you wish. Um, but if I apply that and and uh, we can save it, so when we pull it in, it will look have the border. If I pull another one in and do the same thing, it remembers. Oh, you probably want all your pictures with the same border. And that is really nice. It makes it very fast. Okay, so we'll just save those two. So now we're ready to build our collage. So I'm going to bring my background back in. And then we're going to go to insert. So this allows me to have this as a background. So when I pull a photo in now, it won't replace the green. It will let me layer the photo on top. Now I can move the photo. I can size it with the corners, okay? Um, I can do whatever I want. I can overlap photos. So I'm gonna bring in another one here. You can overlap if you wish. You can click on this one and go over here and say bring uh, bring to front if you want it to overlap that way. So you have lots of options. So you can put in as you know many pictures as you want here. We'll put another little birdie in. This one is not framed. Now what I wanted to show you is you can frame things within this insert function. Just gonna make it a little smaller. And whoops. Just click on this. You can frame with this. That's that's a little. This is a little framing thing, and you just click on the corner of the image, and it'll make a frame. And you can make it smaller. What I don't like about this function is that if I decide to move that picture, it won't move the frame. So then I keep having to move the frame around with it. So I tend to frame them before I go into the collage, uh, but that's that's totally up to you. So now we can also add text. Uh, there are some embellishments, but they're pretty pretty ugly, the stickers, but you could add, go find stickers online and just save them as JPEGs and bring them in. But we're just gonna add some text. I'm gonna hit text, and you can just pull the text down. You can change the size by pulling the, pulling the uh, arrows, or you can just choose a number here, change the text. Um, you can you know, put a date, you can change the font, you can change the color, you can do, do whatever you want. Okay, so that's a basic collage. What I wanted to show you, um, we'll go back to edit, 
Um, what is tricky is if you have a photo like, um, let's just start again. If you have a photo like this, I'll hit insert and I'm gonna bring in this image. Um, it's nice to have the, the, the circular frame, but it's not nice having this white. So it would look fine if you had a white background. But I'm just gonna use the example that if you, if you have a color background and you want to get rid of that white edging, uh, there is a way to do that. So we're gonna go back to edit and we're going to go to this cutout function at the top. And then we'll bring that image back in. And it's like a magic, there's a little magic eraser here, but there's also a brush, so we can use that if we need to. So the magic eraser, you just touch on any area and that color will disappear. And now you've got a perfectly transparent background. Now you can also try and make these completely transparent, but it might pick up part of her dress here and her shoulder. That's okay, you can brush it out like you would with the, uh, oops, with a, with, a, with a masking tool, you can brush that out and you can just have it clear. Whoops, I kind of goofed. Okay, well I goofed, but that's fine. You get the idea. So that means you, you've, got the, um, you've got the image um, with, the, with the clear background. I just gotta save it. Now when it goes to save, uh, it seems to do it automatically into the um, pictures folder. Uh, so I, I'm just going to stick it there for now, um, but just be aware of that it doesn't go into your working folder. And then you can go uh, pick that up when you go, just say close. Um, so you can go pick that up when, when you go back to working with your clutch. So if we go back and we set our background now, take this one out, um, marine insert, yep. So now we just go find that. Uh, that image under pictures. and there it is under my picture so when we bring that in now it's got the nice clear clear background okay so that's basically what I wanted to cover was just to show you those two ways of making collage and how to uh, have things frame nicely and that, those frames were just simply um, simply one of the uh, one of the uh, one of one of the options. So any any of these pictures, you can you can uh, I'll just bring anything in here. You can go in and choose uh, a shape. So I got one of those shapes. And again, if, if all these are free, if you go down really far, then some of these I paid for. But most of these came with the with the free. Okay. So um, I'll just check with. Uh, Chris, if there's any uh, comments on, on those. Uh, no, I think we're fine now. That's, uh, I think we've covered off all of the questions. Uh, there was only one comment in the uh, Q&A section. Actually, somebody asked why Photoscape X is not good for RAW. And I clarified that uh, Photoscape X can handle RAW formats. <laughs> yeah. uh, the older Photoscape 3.7 doesn't. And also to keep in mind that raw formats can vary uh, between manufacturers, certainly, and even camera models within a manufacturer's lines can change as new cameras come out. It may take some time for any photo editing programs to catch up and be able to support the newer raw formats. So just be cautious about that for raw formats. Yeah, and, and typically the raw is going to take longer to load and stuff like that. They're, they're bigger files. But uh, Photoscape X will will handle them. Um, I don't tend to use it for my raw images just because I find that um, I, I just prefer using on one photo raw. It's more designed to 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 give you the fine fine tools for for adjusting photos. But absolutely, it will handle it. Oh, thank you very much again, um, Linda, for that extra part. And thank you, everybody who stayed to listen to this. And don't forget to register for Linda's workshop next week on how to share your photos on the web. Yeah. Thanks a lot, everybody. Great. And don't, don't, don't hesitate to write me. Uh, absolutely don't hesitate. Thanks for attending. Thank you very much, Shana.